Hey, Mark here, and I have a fun giveaway for you. I have five digital copies of Bob Marley, One Love, up for grabs. And if you'd like a copy, just shoot me a message and be like, hey, Mark, I would like a copy of Bob Marley, One Love, because Kingsley Benadire is great. The OA is an amazing show, and he was really good in it. I just love the OA. He's so good in it, and it's really cool to see him in a movie that's just blowing up now. So if you would like a copy of Bob Marley, One Love, just shoot me a message and say, hey, Mark, I would like to win a copy of this. So bring home Bob Marley, One Love on Digital Now. Celebrate the life and music of an icon who inspired generations through his message of love, peace, and unity. Buy Bob Marley, One Love on Digital today and get over 50 minutes of behind-the-scenes footage and deleted scenes. Available at participating retailers, rated PG-13 from Paramount Pictures. Welcome to Movies, Films, and Flicks. I am Mark Hoffmeyer, and joining me is a man who's wearing tiny shorts for this episode. It's John Lovingood. And I have baby-oiled my entire chest, comrade. <laughs> you know, I was watching this movie, and, and you know, you watch it way back in the day, and you remember nothing from it. You just remember, like, I think I blended this Rambo to, like, I think all those that giant action scenes from the 80s, you just blend together in your head. And watching it again during the final battle scene, I was like, I was like, Dolph, it's the middle of the day. There's, there's no shrubbery to like wear camouflage on. There's like no anything. Like, you, and then, but he runs into battle with these short shorts on and he's just blowing people away and just everything is exploding. And Joe Zito probably used half of his budget just blowing everything up in this action scene. And you're just, you're like, this is one of the silliest things I've ever seen in my life with Dolph. And Dolph gets, he gets knocked out, and then he gets up, then he blows things up. He blows a guy's arm off, then he explodes. It's the craziest ending, but he does it all in short shorts. I mean, I approve of this message. <laughs> I, I think it's funny that when I first saw this, which was probably like, I don't know, maybe like 1991 on HBO kind of situation, right? When I first saw this, I don't even think that the shorts processed. I just remember thinking, oh, my God, this is that movie with that badass from Rocky Four as the star. And that's just like it, you know, and granted, you know, there were other movies that I had seen of him, but he wasn't like he was at the time, probably just the guy from Rocky Four, you know, when I was 12 years old. So I'm watching this and, and I don't know if Mark, I don't know if like early 90s Mark and John would have even registered that they were short shorts because at that time the people who were like in high school like high school seniors Those or college the kids they, i mean they were just maybe just starting to transition away from that stuff but i mean we grew up seeing like our friends older brothers right like yeah. wearing that that was so it's like that was normal and now we're watching it and it's like what is this dude wearing <laughs> And also, too, man, like, the 80s went so hard on this shirtless hero. Like, Arnold Schwarzenegger in Commando, right? R like, Rambo in Rambo 2. Just, you know, he... Like, it's just, like, even, like, the Rocky movies, he's just a boxer. Like, all those stars, they just went really hard on shirtless scenes where they blow people up. Or just sleeveless scenes when they blow people up. Like, the end of Predator is all Arnold getting tossed around like a beach ball by the Predator. So it's... I guess, it, you know, you watch it back in the day and it's like, yeah, it's an 80s action movie. <laughs> like it's it, there's nothing weird about it at the time. It's aside awesome at from. The time. Yeah. Like, yeah, it just and you, you know, like just he walks. There's a scene. Right. So uh, this movie's about Dolph Lundgren. He, he's a Swedish man who plays a Russian man named Nikolai Rachenko. And he's tasked to go undercover and kill a a leader like a um, just. Like a just a, a rival leader. So he, what's the plot of this, John? How do we explain this in a nutshell? Like yeah, he's... yeah. So it's like there there there's some conflict zone in Africa that's occupied by by Russia and Cuba, <laughs> and right? Cuba. Right, right time. Well, little little <laughs> like like you know post missile crisis situation. And yeah, there's this. I guess this guy with a lot of tri local tribe influence 
of uh, of the like people, a rebel leader of the local resistance uh, tribes. And this guy's name is Kalanda. This is the guy we have to befriend, but we're really befriending him to get to the other leaders when Kalanda is in this prison camp. Well, I'm not a prison camp. He's just in prison at this Russian and Cuban encampment, right? Mm-hmm. And so Dolphin. And he has there. to win him over and go undercover. And he's just stationed there, right? He's just stationed there, and he says, "You need to befriend him." He's given no instruction on how, right? This is our Spetsna. He's just used to going and slitting throats and shooting people, and and, mm-hmm. and now we got to masse a little bit. And uh, <laughs> I, I love that the way that he initiates his plan is 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 <laughs> is getting crap faced, schnockered, and shooting up a bar. And when someone comes in and says, have you, we, have you lost your mind? No, just out of bullets. Oh, are you out of your mind? I totally ruined it. Yeah. Are you out of your mind, just out of bullets. And there's a scene in that bar fight where he walks into it and he, he knocks out a guy. Like he takes three gut shots in a row and the guy hitting him goes, hmm, after the three gut shots, like, hey, this guy's a tank. Dolphin absolutely obliterates him. I know his name. I know his name is, but you know, like Rachenko in this or Nikolai, but I'm calling him Dolph. So Dolph walks up to the bar, and there's just a guy sitting at the bar, and Dolph pushes this guy so hard off of his chair, like it's one of the hardest pushes I've ever seen in cinema, and he just obliterates a guy with a push, and then like a guy stands up to look at him and sits down, then he blows. It's like, just it's absurd, and he's just drinking. And before he goes out, John, he's just laying in bed. Then he gets up and he does his hair for about a minute. Like, he he tussles his hair, then he gets out, then everyone's checking him out, and then he just beats up everyone in a bar. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. I guess, you know, that push a... that you mentioned, I, I feel like, yeah, that's the most gratuitously aggressive. But, like, why didn't you just, why didn't you just, like, put the guy in a sleeper hold and, and knock him out at that point, right? Just just break his neck. Like, that, that strikes me as the kind of obnoxious aggression that we're going to look forward to in the remake of Roadhouse. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, John, imagine being that stunt guy. Like, the stunt person was obliterated by that push. Like, that was a full-on 80s Dolph push. And he just pulverized the poor guy. And then you're just sitting here watching this going, what's happening? And then they escape, and they're in this truck, and he's like, hello, amigos. And then he, you know, like, you know, you know what I love, what I miss about 80s action movies? Is that I miss when people used to throw grenades and then they would explode perfectly, and then two guys would be on a trampoline, and then right. they would... <laughs> and, and the grenade would, like, explode as it would make impact with the ground, right? Yeah. Like, that moment. <laughs> that moment, and then it would lead to these guys on a trampoline just jettison, <laughs> jettisoning themselves. Like, there's buried trampolines all over a field, and stunt guys are just jumping on them as, like, a squib goes off <laughs> underneath them. I miss 80s grenades. I really do, John. They are... Uh, yeah, I miss an 80s. They don't really do grenades like they used to. No, not it, right. It, it, no, I think it's fair. If anything, we're, we're starting to see a more realistic take on the grenade. And now the trope is is the play that the audience knows that it's going to take a while. And now, and then you get oh. to play with how long it takes. Whereas before, it was like a water balloon. <laughs> <laughs> like that was a water balloon and it did not, there was no, there were no fragments. Those frag grenades did not fragment. They just gave off force like Gene yeah. Ray was using telekinesis to launch people away from it. Yeah. There's no shrapnel in these grenades. You're right. It hits the ground and it just goes poof right. and energy exudes. And then a magic trampoline jumps the guy in the air. They're Gene grenades. Okay. <laughs> Gene Grenades. That's a Gene Grenades. I'm getting old. Oh, I can't do this. That's part of the title. But just, it's just, yeah, I just want to be there when they buried trampolines in the ground. And, you know, I miss, like, just perfect rocket launcher shots. Like, there's a scene where Dolph has his gun at the end, and he's just obliterating people. He kills, he kills, like, 92 people in this movie. I watched a couple kill counts, and no one's quite sure. But I feel like 92 is a good number. And he, he's just running around. He doesn't reload any of the grenades in his gun, but he is blowing up towers. <laughs> left and i mean not just blowing up john like these are like these are blowing up like this is a joe zito you know missing an action invasion usa explosion like there are like he's not just destroying them he's like destroying any concept of them like does that mean like there's no like they're they are obliterated 
by his rocket launcher skills. And it's just so 80s, and it just made me laugh so hard. Uh, you know, the other day, they, I was watching this Oppenheimer behind-the-scenes video, and they're like, oh, yeah, we like we filled up this one thing with gasoline, and then we put some other things in it, and we blew it up. And they're like, nowadays, it's kind of weird, but back in the 80s, this is what you did with everything. I'm like, yeah, that's right. Because, uh, yeah, John, the explosions in this movie are wonderful so when they when they were escaping from the prison and uh, a boy, and i we need to talk so much about about perfect grenades M. emmett walsh is the oh, goofy man. anti-sidekick right the antagonistic sidekick but that is but when they're escaping and they eventually go down that 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 hill if you will i'm sitting there like that would have exploded three different times if that was an enemy car like that with what <laughs> enemy cars would go through so much less than that and explode in this movie. And that that vehicle was impervious. There was there was clearly no gasoline or or, or, or combustible components there. That's yeah, that's another thing I miss about 80s action movies. If you hit the tailgate of a villain's car, it would explode. Right. It would just blow up. And and you know what? You know, I was watching the stunts in this movie and then I read interviews from Dolph Lundgren. He's like, yeah, I did a lot of those stunts. Like, he remember when M. M. Walsh kicks him out of the car and onto a motorcycle, oh, yeah. then he jumps back from the motorcycle onto the car. Like, Dolph is on that. Like, that's in, that's insane. <laughs> like, that's like, but I mean, when I read more about the production, right? Like, Joe Zito directed it, but it was it was written and produced by this guy Jack Abramoff, who I had never heard of him before. But the more I started researching, I learned that he's one of the most corrupt lobbyists of all time. What is? And he actually. Pl- and he, and he pled guilty in the uh, 2000s for frauding uh, Native American tribes was this? out of, like, uh, Jack Abramoff. Okay. And, and He's a lobbyist. And and he frauded, like, uh, these Native American tribes, they were going to do some gambling activities. And he frauded them $25 million. He defrauded them. And then he went to, like, jail for three years, and he worked at a pizza place and did the, the – um, books for them for like ten dollars an hour in a halfway house and then he immediately got out and then he started working for all the other you know like he became a lobbyist again and then 2020 he got he got in trouble again for like a a bitcoin fraud and he's on trial for that and like this guy they were supposed to shoot this movie in swaziland and then like right before they shot like you know that you know they they had like they had tom savini on this movie (laughs) doing all the makeup effects they had Dolph Lundgren, but they're like, okay, we're not doing it in, in Swaziland. We're going to go to, it's Namibia now, but we're going to go to South Africa, which was apartheid, you know, had the apartheid government at the time. Warner Brothers found out about this. They pulled all funding, but apparently Jack Abramoff funded this movie and no one knows where any of the money came from. <laughs> and, and like, no one got paid on this movie. Tom Savini said the food was terrible and his family almost, almost died in a flood. Like, they had a, a traveling caravan of animals with them that they would just bring and dump out whenever they had. They cast, like, real bushmen. And apparently, you know, like, the pro-apartheid forces helped fund this movie. And then they had a lot of protesters, and then people backed out. And it was, like, it was a massive uh, controversy at the time. The budget ballooned. Like, you know, Dolph almost got blacklisted. Like, they were like, you should not be shooting here. Like, they made, there was a deal. Like, the United States government was like, people cannot work here. But he did it anyway. <laughs> And then this movie made a bunch of money on video and foreign sales and nobody ever got residuals for it. Like people didn't get paid. And then this Jack Abramoff goes to jail for ripping off people for 25 million. And he talks about during his lobbying days, how he would just like buy all the governor's tickets. And he's probably, they say he's the most corrupt lobbyist of all time, but he made this movie because he was like staunchly anti-communist. But then they also said that he made this movie to undermine the the African national Congress. Who like like they they were in opposition to apartheid, and so like he did this to like further kind of destroy their reputation. And so this movie has so this he was crazy anti-communist politi- but pro-apartheid. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Okay. All right. I just want to I just want to make sure I have his his morals straight here. Yeah. Yes. So he be, yeah, <laughs> John. But this guy is so corrupt. Like he gets out of jail and he immediately like Bitcoin comes out and he's like, what's the angle? And I was reading interviews about him, and everyone's like, "What's the?" This guy's like, "What's the angle?" Hey, man, like, we got this perfectly legal place. Uh, if you just sit, uh, sit there, we will make tons of money. All right, how do we make it illegal? No, 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 make it illegal. We, no, we don't do that. Like, we don't make it illegal. Let's make it illegal. Like, no, like, I just took twenty five million and I sent it over to here. Why? <laughs> like, it's, it's like this is all legal. Like, he's one of those guys. 
but then just reading about it and just, just, I don't know. It just made me very happy to see, like, not happy, but it's like so 80s. Like, on the surface, this is a, this is a classic, like, let's go kill a, a nebulous army of communists, even though this was Russian and Cubans. And, like, let's go blow them up. Because you had Rambo 2, you had Commando, like, you had those kind of movies. But yeah, then I started just reading about it. And, like, he was, uh, like, he just promoted for, like, the Reagan Doctrine, and he just, he promoted aid to anti communist guerrilla movements. And then, yeah, but he, he was like, he was for apartheid, anti communist. Nobody got paid. It's just a really, it's just a bomb. It's a, it reminds me of, like, the franchise pictures guys who sw- swindled a German company out of tons of money. Like, it, it it's, it's just a, it, it's just, I love movie making because of the amount, amount of money you can launder <laughs> through it. And this is one of them. But if you just take all that out and you just watch Dolph just glisten and then like kill boars and like hang out with Bushmen and just blow the living crap out of 92 people, just make them explode. It's a good time. The action, you know, I feel like was better than I expected it to be, too. I mean, yeah, because when I'm younger, Zito, I'm, right? easy to, I'm easy to explain uh, to um, impress when I'm young, you know, but like anything's cool most of the time but like I was, i'm watching this and it's like you know this movie where like i could i could find 25 people our age randomly even at like we'll say at a video game store but they're our age right so they're they're the kinds of people who might and i'll be like do you know the movie red scorpion i'll bet like one or two are going to say yes <laughs> like it, this is yeah. it, it's not obs- it's not truly obscure but it was very missable and this is not something that I feel like I've seen, you know, on HBO or Showtime on my digital cable before I've been cable, you know, over the last 15 or 20 years. Like, it, like I don't think I've ever seen – and I always had all the movie channels, all the Cinemax, all the Showtimes, all the HBOs, you know, all the everything. I don't think I've seen this available on TV since there was only HBO and HBO2. <laughs> and people are sitting there like there were only two. Why would you spend that money? That was fi- that was fifteen dollars a month in like nineteen ninety. Like that was such a big deal. Like, yeah, that was expensive. I never had HBO. It was too much. Disney was too much to have too. Yeah. I never got to have any of that. But you know, yeah, John, this wasn't around. You and I could have turned on the TV back in the day, and Lethal Weapon Two or Predator or any of those movies would have been on TV. Die Hard. They were always on. This was not because you know why. This is a movie released in 1989 that feels like it should have been released by Canon in 1984. Sure. Right? This is... Or just it this, cleaner. Okay. Yeah. It, <laughs> there would have been so much nudity. So I showed my students the documentary Electric Boogaloo about Canon, uh-huh. like the wild story, and they were watching it. And my students were like, what was this? I'm like, this was 80s filmmaking from Canon. Like, this is just... Gratuitous nudity, violence, They would follow an actor into like a like a, a Philippines strip club in reality, and they'd probably just like pay someone a hundred bucks before they walked in. And so like all, yeah. like these the so these Asian strippers you see in the background are real Asian strippers who didn't even know a movie was going to happen. Like the, the guys like Menachem and all those guys like they didn't even know movies were being filmed. Like oh yeah, we got something in Budapest going on right now. Like you know what's funny. There's that Jack Quarter main movies, and he's like, I want that Stone Woman. And so like, oh, okay, Sharon Stone. But he wanted the romance in the Stone Woman, not Sharon Stone. Uh-huh. So when he saw the dailies, he's like, who is this lady? And it, it's like, well, Sharon Stone. He's like, no, I wanted Kathleen Turner, the the Stone Woman. It's like, it's just, the, like this, the, they were bonkers, man. And just you're like, hey, let's make Wuthering Heights with, with nudity. Let's do this. And like, this movie doesn't really have that. This is a, yeah, it's not, yeah, this would have been much different. But. It still feels like a canon movie with a couple better action scenes because I think Zito knows how to blow things up. I mean, if you've seen like Zito can explode things. I feel like the car action scenes, too, were very specifically inspired, especially because of the terrain, were inspired by Indiana Jones movies. Yeah, exactly. I feel like when they're doing the city, the town assault at the end, that it was very specifically influenced by Rambo 2. You know, mm-hmm. in, in in no bad way. I'm just saying, like that's that's just the, the best example that we had, and it's they were very similar in in good ways, right? And and just the approach of it all, right? And uh, so I mean, these inspirations were very 
clear, but but then they were done very well. Like they were done mm-hmm. a lot better than I again than I would have expected. There were more explosions, more expensive explosions than I would have expected. So not just the quality, but the number of them, the number of things getting shot up, the number of shots of people shooting things, just all these things that have a lot of people running around or getting springboarded <laughs> from an explosion. Like there's just it, it, there's a lot of it's almost like when someone compares like a good martial arts movie back when Van Damme was around and you watch a 90 minute movie that has 12 minutes at best of fighting where most of that running time is Van Damme looking nervous. Mm-hmm. Right. Whereas 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 then you go to John Wick, there's one fight, John Wick four, there's one fight going upstairs that's continuous violence that is over 12 minutes in and of itself with more techniques per unit time times five than in any Van Damme movie in its entirety, right? But So it's like, you know, things get so scaled up, and I think that for its time, and and for its how unrenowned it was, this really was way amped up to what you expect. And, And boy, I really appreciate that. And again, the execution was good. All the car stuff, it's easy to phone that in. Shot of dude, you know, up close in the car, Wide shot car swerving and, you know, it's only driving 15 miles an hour following another car. You know, it's it, it wasn't so phoned in even the things that you expect them to. Like they really mm-hmm. they really worked on this. I mean, dude, the dude did missing in action in Invasion USA. Like he knew how to blow stuff up. Like like Invasion USA is nothing but explosions, I feel like. So, I mean, Zito knew how to do it. But I, you know. They are. The, the 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 car chase is surprisingly good. The final action scene is surprisingly good. And Dolph said that, you know, he's like, this movie has personality and it takes its time, unlike a lot of action movies today. And this is quite, it's not really a straightforward, like, all right, so Predator, right? Dudes go in, they get attacked by an alien. There's a couple little subplots, whatever. Commando, he's on a mission to go get his daughter back. This one, it's like, he he goes undercover, he goes to kill the guys. He gets, he fails, then he goes in jail, and then he gets pricked with a bunch of needles, and then he escapes, and then some, uh, a bushman finds him, and then he hunts some boar, and he deals with some scorpions, and he he gets a tattoo. He has a 25 minute walkabout. Yeah, he does. And like, he's just rolling in the sand. He's vision questing. Yeah, like, he goes on, on a vision quest, he, he, like, rolls down a hill, he's actually in sand dunes, And then by the time that, you know, the Russians and and Cubans have slaughtered all these villages and killed all these people, you're like, man, there's like 10 minutes left. And then he just looks at everybody and goes, let's kick some ass. And then just explosions go off, John, and he just storms in and starts slaughtering people. And then he blows up a helicopter. Then he, you know, he blows up the major general. And then at the final line, they're like, yeah, and he's like, yeah, fucking A. And then the movie ends. In in proper 80s form. Yeah. But it's like, it, it, you know what's funny? He walks 10 feet from the helicopter, and then he blows up the helicopter, and there's just no, like, in this world, too, helicopters don't, there's, like, no sonic wave from explosions, you know, or there's no force. I think it all just goes up, because he was probably, what, 10 feet, 20 feet away from right, that right. helicopter explosion, and he, nothing hits him. But it still looks cool. Well, dude, he, he'd, like, be concussed. Yeah. Oh yeah, he his head would be ringing. This do you think that's why this isn't a movie that's I mean, do you think this, you know, a lot of smaller scale action films play really well on cable. But do you think because this one just has so much plot and like the history of like it's it's quite in like it slows down. Like the end final the final action scene's like 12 minutes long total and then credits. If that. It's like no, it's like 10 minutes long. And it, b- between that is like a a failed murder attempt some torture and then a, a, a walkabout. Long walkabout. Is that, does that hurt? Do you think that hurt like it's overall watchability? I don't, I don't know, dude. I, I don't really feel like that was its problem. I, I feel like its problem was, uh, and of course I have no recollection of how this went down. Right. But I, I have a feeling it's more of how they marketed the movie. And even though, so we're taking the bad guy from a really great movie. He was a wonderful villain. And making that bad guy into a leading man. And again, it's like there was Masters of the Universe. There, people were people were doing this with him already. 
Uh, I, I, Ganon were <laughs> right, um, but but still, like I I feel like they had trouble marketing it. But then I I think because it's 1989 and he is the Russian and he we only we mostly know him as a villain before that. I I feel it's harder to get on board when Arnold Schwarzenegger plays a Russian in Red Heat. Arnold Schwarzenegger is already beloved. I mean, even if it's for playing a villain in Terminator, but then, you know, Conan and uh, he had done other things like he was already known and beloved, whereas Dolph was the bad guy from Rocky Four. Dolph was Ivan Drago in people's eyes. I, I think that was probably the problem and, and that it takes place in Africa and it involves Russians and Cubans. And other than like M. M. Walsh, am I getting his name right? I think. Um, uh, there's pretty much uh, an absence of non-accented characters. I, I don't think that 1989 America had the metropolitan melting pot mindset of getting behind heroes like that. Yeah, that's true. And uh, you know, the I, I think just the lack of the big stars, right? The you know exactly like you said, just a Swedish dude who was a villain playing a Russian, battling Russians and Cubans. Yeah. And then also the bad press. But you know, do you, do you think not do you have you looked at the action movies released in in 89? It was an odd year so for action what cinema. What else did we have? Like, well, like okay, so like Blind Fury, a movie that I absolutely love. Blood but sport? it's still Blind Fury. Bloodsport. Well, you have Kickboxer, you have Black Rain, Lethal Weapon 2, Blue Steel, but you have like No Holds Barred. You have Dead Bang, Best of the Best, Cyborg came out that year, Lockout. It's just like Pink Cat, you know, Canine came out that year, Roadhouse, Next of Kin, Tango and Cash. It wasn't a great year. It sounds like a for, great year to me. Yeah, but like, uh, no, so here's the thing, though. Like, Tango and Cash, Roadhouse, those had such long lives on cable, right? Because they have such a personality to mm-hmm. them. And like, you know, like they do. They really have a personality to them. But then I think, you know, Cyborg even does, too. Like, Cyborg's a weird canon film, uh, which he, he, Sean Clove and Dan plays Gibson Rickenbacker. And he, it's just in the, the strangest <laughs> sci-fi movie. Like, and what, I, so wasn't I think, that a reappropriated Spider-Man script? Oh, man, it was um, yeah, it was it was a sequel for something. I swear to God, I think that <laughs> yeah. because of someone's contract, they, they took some writer's Spider-Man script and air quotes rewrote the Spider-Man script in this. I, I, I think I'm remembering that correctly. <laughs> wow. I mean, yeah, no, you're right. It was a sequel to something. But yeah, maybe, was, yeah, I think it was Spider-Man. And then they just turn it into that. It's the stra- It was, I just think, you know, like Blind Fury I love, Cyborg I love. Like, I own these movies. And we've talked about Tango and Cash, uh, Roadhouse, you know, like I've been on the Roadhouse Minute podcast. But it's, it's just, it was, that's, it's such a weird year though, isn't it? Like, the movie, like, it's Black Rain. That movie's crazy. You know, just next of kin. Like it's fun, but like it's still next of kin. Like it's just an odd year. I don't. And the Punisher with Dolph Lundgren came out, where he's riding around the sewer, slaughtering people. It occurs Which, to me. I don't know. So, so we had a uh, um, Tango and Cash was that year. Red Scorpion was that year, and also unofficially titled House Part Three, also titled The Horror Show. All three of these movies, Ryan James. Oh, Brian James, nice. the the guy the guy who lowered Tango and Cash yeah. into the uh, electrocuting yeah. water, the the our our our, our blonde like <laughs> yeah. boy cold as death eyed, uh uh I won't call him a lackey but like prime henchman and Red Scorpion and he was the bad guy in House Part Three, all 1989. That was the year of Brian James. It really was. You know, whenever I think about him, I think about him in Fifth Element. Oh, great role. Is that who is? That's him, yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I know he's Tango and Cash, and I know he's Red Scorpion, but for some reason, so when I saw him on screen in this movie, I went, oh, Fifth Element. <laughs> like, that don't, that's my immediate uh, thing. Yeah, but that was a good year for him, huh? 89. Dude. Long live the character actors, man. But, you know, the problem with Red Scorpion, too, is it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's just Red Scorpion. I don't, I, I think it has a personality though. And I don't think Dolph is as bad as most people say. And like Zito, remember that scene where M.M. at Walsh is like, yeah, take it off. And then he just blows up. Like, 
for most of the movie, Dolph is just, you know, Megan walked into the room when I was watching this. She's like, man, why is Dolph so ripped? I'm like, this was 80s Dolph. Like, 80s Dolph was just this. It's like, it was just, it was just him walking around without his shirt, hanging out with a bushman, killing boars. Well, I mean, that, Masters of the Universe, Rocky IV, yeah. that's, that was his thing. But he's funny in this one, though. He has some good lines. I think they worked with him pretty well. He grimaces well. And the, listen, man, like, I could watch this final action scene on repeat. It's so absurd. But it's like, he, he shoots a guy's arm off so that the guy doesn't throw a grenade Clean at him. Off. Clean off, yeah. too. Like, it just disappears. <laughs> it's almost like they did one of those things where they did a, they, they have a shot of him holding his arm up with a grenade, and then they, they yell cut, and he holds his arm there, and then they were, they, they replace, with the prosthesis, and then they just start they or they start filming again, and it's just boom, it's gone. <laughs> oh man! And then he tries, and you know what? That's a grenade that doesn't explode like a water balloon for effect, because he tries to reach it. That was fun. But you know, though. you know, yeah. this movie though, it's silly. You know, all the politics aside with Jake Ab- uh, Abramoff, Jack Ab- Abramoff, who's just a a lifelong ho- like criminal, pretty much. Like it, I think Zito and Savini and them. I guess they did what they could to make like, you know, you and I grew up with the Russians and like nebulous terrorists being the villains for so many years. Like we, like, I don't know. Russians were major villains in our youth growing up. Absolutely. Yeah. Like we, and so like, you're just, just, all right, we're going to blow up the Russians. All right. Yeah, sure. And then like he has a Spetsnaz has a change of heart. He gets a scorpion tattoo and then he kicks some ass. This movie, like, I don't think this movie could work as like a manifesto for anything, right? Like you, no one's going to change sides or be influenced by this, are they? Yeah, I don't think so. This is a, but and, and, that's the other thing is that even though we're rooting for Dolph the whole time because we love Dolph, but, and we know he's the star. That's the other thing. We know he's the star of the movie, but he starts out, he's a Russian. He's just, you know, he's not like the reluctant warrior he's like okay i'm gonna go on this mission and when things are going rough for him when they uh when when he's trying to do his mission to get to this other tribal leader and they're like i think it would be best if we kept you confined he's like i am russian soldier i am strive for excellence and he's like punching the well like he's still he's still on his mission he tried to kill that man he only became a hero because because he failed to kill that man because that man knew that he didn't trust him that's the thing. If Dolph was more successful, he just would have murdered this nice man, and then the Russians would have laid waste to even more uh, African towns, right? So it's like he's still not even a good guy at all, at all at that point. I was pretty shocked when he went to assassinate the guy because – I'm with you. you know, I, I, thought, thought, I became... thought there was a little turn happening in there. Yeah, and like, and then they job on the hunt him. And then they, they're all just waiting for him. And, and, you know, they, they turn on the lights and they're all behind him. But, you know, there's more to it than that, too. And granted, I'm with you. Like, I, I thought that, you know, you know, uh, Kalanda's like, no, don't shoot. He's with me. You're safe. You know, he comes out, whatever. I mean, he's playing his role very well, apparently. But, like, M. Emmett Walsh, like, he's the character. It, it, normally, that character should be slowly warming up. He, like, does not warm up to him until the final action act like he kicks him out of the car to leave him for dead to be captured after that escape he he uh he 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 always is saying like how can you trust this guy like that normally that character in a modern movie is there to start out skeptical and then to be the person who's the most critical to help the audience when that character starts to turn to help the audience be like oh he's getting this comic you know, relief approval now. Right. But it doesn't happen yeah. until the end after the walkabout, after Dolph shows up and he's like, Oh, you're on our side now, basically. Right. And then, and then he shows up at the end, like this, the character that I'm talking about would normally cliche do it. Hey, it looked like you needed some help. They all just show up like an Indiana Jones character, <laughs> you know, at the end, just in the nick of time or something. Uh, but, but he's, he's an antagonist, practically the whole way and uh, again this movie well and when i think again about the marketing too again red heat arnold schwarzenegger but it's arnold schwarzenegger this is red scorpion too right it's not called 
redeemed Kami. Not that that's a good name, but right. It, it's, it, it's, it's red scorpion. The, the, the poster is, is not again, because most people just know him as Ivan Drago, not there's Arnold Schwarzenegger in the red heat poster. You can't, I don't, I think they were, they were hoping they could get away with the same things and it just wasn't working. And then they make this movie that isn't as comic reliefy nearly as a Schwarzenegger movie. So it doesn't really have that. They try and give it some soul. That's not something you do with a Schwarzenegger movie. I mean, you, you, it, heart is fine, but this has long, soulful change of, you know, philosophy on life stuff Mm -hmm. right so it's i think it's even tough after the movie comes out for someone to talk about it and and get audiences psyched i'll bet siskel and ebert didn't even know how to how to talk about this to a general audience yeah that's why i had such a hard time explaining it in the beginning because it just uh, yeah and you know what Dolph actually compared this movie to something like the ten commandments or spartacus He's like, the movies back then weren't as quick, and the audience had patience to sit through the three acts. So at Red Scorpion, you have the patience to sit, sit through that middle with the Bushman. You sit through the tattoo se- no, sequence, the the hunt. And unlike any other action film of the 80s, you actually see the lead character's transformation. And then Dolph said it's a memorable film. That's just it. You know what the problem is? Is that it's too much of a film for something where we came in for a flick. Yeah. In a really good flick, we get to call a movie, like a Schwarzenegger movie, a Stallone movie. This has too many proper film components in that middling, and actually in the very beginning, too. The very beginning and that middling walkabout vision quest change of, you know, character heart, like these are it's 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 too much for its for the genre that we think it is. Yeah. No, you, and, and you, and I, I think you're absolutely right because everything you think about this movie is, is essentially just, it's just a canon film, right? With explosions and bad guys, and and then it's not. It's 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 unique. I was I did not really remember the journey I was going to go on while watching this again, and then the research journey was really fun, and it just yeah, I, I mean, ran, well, I mean, the first like First Blood was good, like First Blood's a film. Oh, yeah. And then the other Rambo movies just became straight up explosion films, but Rambo never really went through a character arc as much as Nikolai did in Red Scorpion. He just blew. I showed Megan the kill counts for Rambo two and Commando, and she was like, "What?" She's like, I don't think Megan has watched Rambo two or Commando, and so showing when 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 Rambo blows up that guy and the only thing left is his shoe. <laughs> And then in Commando, she's like, did she did he just cut that guy's arm off? Is he throwing saws? Did he just axe a guy in the balls? Like and then like to let off some steam. Right. <laughs> just it's uh man, that's an absurd movie. But yeah, this movie's not so much that. It's just an odd it, it, it's an odd little thing. It really is. It's uh too you know like and like just knowing Jack Abram Jake Jack Abr- Abramoff funded this. That adds like a weird little wrinkle to it. No, because the guy's just a complete dirtbag. But yeah, it's. I'm glad we talked about this one, John, because I think Zito tried here. Yeah, I, I, there, there's clearly a lot of heart on the cat on the cast crew side of this. I, you, I think that that it shines through pretty well that everyone involved cared about this. Like you know, they had a wildly shifty producer, didn't pay many much out of them. But I, I just, I'm telling you, man, when you get someone like Zito who had worked with Canon and just knew how to blow things up when you have Tom Savini, you know, like you, you have, I don't know, they'll make things work no matter where they are. And I think red Scorpion's a good case of that, even though it's just, a, it's just such a silly, such a silly movie. I mean, I, I guess I get the 17%. That's Rotten has, Tomatoes. 17%. Yeah, and, it's, and it's 5.2 on IMDb. That's not that bad on IMDb. No, IMDb yeah, yeah. is rough. I think the, that's about right. The 5.2. That seems like right. It's, yeah. Like I wouldn't give it over a six. I, I'd like to see more like a 35% on Rotten Tomatoes. I feel like that would be a more fair assessment to double that. <laughs> yeah. No, that's if, if I saw 31, I'd be like, that's cool. Yeah, that's fine. I'll, but, I'll get upset. Yeah. 
<laughs> but seventeen, like the teens, that 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 stings a little bit. Uh, I mean, yeah, I just five point two feels right. When I saw that, I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. Right. Because you know, like the the car chase is good, even though it's very Indiana Jones. The 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 final battle scene is very good, even though it's like Commando and it's like Rambo two. But I mean, any time that you have Dolph Lundgren just raiding a fort in short shorts, <laughs> just so, I'm like, I'm watching that scene. And my fiance Sarah walks in the room, and she doesn't know this movie. And she says, "Oh, look at him in his little shorty shorts shooting the guns!" And I'm like, "No, honey, like th- there's a very logical reason that he's in." It's like, "No, no, you don't get to say anything. He's in shorty shorts shooting his gun, having a good time, and that's all I'm going to think about." <laughs> so basically, you know, both of our significant others had the same reaction. <laughs> The dolphin, this movie. But there legit was a good. Re- so he, right? He, he, is, he, he yeah, he's escapes. Training. He, he's walking across the desert. He's trying to stay alive. He, he didn't have shoes. He had to rip off the legs of his pants to wrap mm-hmm. them around his, his feet. And then when it came wartime, there was not a J.C. Penny or a men's warehouse. He, he, he had what he had. He, he, <laughs> he and he had wrapped his shirt around his head. So he didn't get heat stroke, right, or, or get burned all mm-hmm. over his face. I mean, there's a reason that he is shirtless and wearing short shorts, and it's a good reason. But he is. <laughs> we can't deny that, I suppose. It, it's just funny though because I've just I've never seen that before, really, like in in one of these kinds of action movies, and it's just it's just such a. You know what it reminds is, me of. When Jack Burton has the gun, but he also has like the smeared lipstick on his face. Yeah. Like it's one of those, like, except, except then drawn out for 12 minutes of action. Oh man. Like the, and then there's just the torture scene. Dude, that was, I mean, but listen. that was serious though. Like sticking that thing like through his butt. First off, He's not functioning as well after that. I just want to. No. I, I I really don't think that he'd be functioning that well. I really. He's a big, strong guy. He can deal with some pain. He's a specimen, or whatever. But that he came out of that like nothing happened, and like through his trap, it went through his trap and went. Maybe and on his pec though, I'm willing to say I don't actually think that went through muscle tissue. I think that was just subdermal through hmm. the pec. But that still would have hurt a lot, a lot, <laughs> a lot. And it's such a lot. This movie takes its time on scenes too. Like, it, when when remember he's just laying in bed and he gets up and does his hair. I'm like, oh, is he just gonna go out for a drink? Well, like, they, they like, need what? to establish to the audience how tall he was and that he didn't fit in the bed. Yeah, it's oh yeah, because <laughs> his legs were hanging out. Because this half of his boot was hanging off of it. But all right, listen. If okay, okay so if I had to take the scene where M. 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 Walsh kicks him out of the car and he lands on a motorcycle, the push in the bar. And then just the obliteration of all the buildings at the end and shooting the guy's arm off. It, there's enough moments in here to make this, I wouldn't say that this is far from top tier 80s action cinema, but it, it's, it's like mid, mid tier. It's not mid to top and it's not top, but it's mid tier because it has a few moments. Because how many action movies have we watched where there's just nothing there? Where you watch it and you're like, that was fine, but there's no moments to really cling to. I feel like this one has four or five of those. It's interesting you say that. So I actually have a note. Like I even, it, this is probably about an hour into the movie, maybe a little more. And I wrote to myself, this isn't great, dot, dot, <laughs> but it's pretty good. <laughs> and, and you know what it is? It's, it's very capably made. It, you know, yeah. there's nothing wow. Like, you know, you don't, like, you know, this is, it, 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 it might be like a, well, I don't even think it's a step below Red Heat. I think that Red Heat just worked better. Mm-hmm. They played the genre hand a little better, right? And weren't trying to be filmy. But like, so this is probably comparable in overall quality to something like Red Heat. However, if we compare it to something like True Lies, oh no, I, like there's not even a conversation to be had. Like this mm-hmm. is True Lies is echelons plural above this well, and Red Heat, right? But uh, but this is but it's good. It's pretty good. It's uh like it's like if I had this beer, they'd be like, hey John, how's that beer? It's pretty good. It's like oh okay, they have it over in the cooler in there. No, I don't need to buy any, but but I'm really enjoying this, right? Yeah. I think, like, it's, it's, it's hit the spot. It's this one of the those. Spot. Like to all the bre- any brewery 
like enthusiast knows that feeling like, no, this is really good. You want any? No, I don't need to take any home. One's good, but it's really good. I'm really enjoying it. Right. That That's it. If I'm, if I'm at a function and this is there, I will be happy. Yeah, drink it all day. But it, yeah, <laughs> so I will bring home a six pack. <laughs> you know something else that I really loved that was totally random, and I feel like it only happened because M. Emmett Walsh was capable of doing it. Is and again, it's a very Indiana Jones thing. He's in the back of the truck during the prison escape, and then there's that window where the people in the back of the truck can talk to the people in the cabin, and that overweight dude in like who, who who's got to be near sixty years old. Goes head first, like a seven year old, right? Just coming up to hang out with his dad. So, and then his, his head goes down and out of sight and he pops back up and, and it was one cut. It was him doing it. There was no stunt to this. That, that man did this and he looks like the kind of guy who would throw out his back bending over too fast to pick up a piece of trash off the ground. Like, and, and I'm sitting there like, that's only there because he could do that. That's that's the only reason that happened. Mm-hmm. But, but See, I didn't even notice it. I'm just sitting there, dude. Like, I'm sure you got you got to just go watch this bit, and and you're gonna see, and think of the physique of this man and what he does. And I'm just sitting there, like this isn't even its own cut within the scene. So that if he they were talking, he comes out and they keep talking. And and I'm just I, I was so like he just did it. He just did it. Which tells me that I think that they were doing the shot and it was supposed to be done a different way. And he says, no, no, what if I just do this? And they're like, okay, M. Emmett Walsh, we'll see. <laughs> and they just, they're just running and Dolph is like trying not to like have wide eyes when he does this. Because Dolph couldn't do that. He's like, I see you. I see you, uh, M. Emmett Walsh. You know, he, he, that dude is shockingly spry for a man of his age and dimensions of that time who – doesn't look like a CrossFitter or a parkour enthusiast. <laughs> hey, and also since we're on the, I, I, I just want to keep on the the Josito train. He also did Friday the Thirteenth, the final chapter, which is the one where Crispin Glover is just screaming for a corkscrew. One of the best dance like ever. One, yeah, that movie has some personality too. So, like, I, I think this guy just knew how to. I don't know. I think there are directors out there who will never be upper echelon. But you give them something, and they'll make a movie that has a few elements that you just enjoy, or you can find something to like in them. And I think that was the, like he hasn't had a long career, but it, like you look at his movies and you're like, oh, he did all right. So, but Invasion USA, man, have you watched that movie? You know, that's one of those movies where I assume I've seen it, but it was probably in that blur of early '90s USA and TNT network. Saturday afternoon action movie marathons. And one of those channels, I think it was USA, every Saturday or Sunday afternoon would have the marathon. They call it movies for guys who like movies. It would be like, <laughs> you know, a Kurt yeah. Russell movie, something starring Lorenzo Lamas, and then later like some Hulk Hogan domestic movie like Suburban Commando or Mr. Nanny. <laughs> uh, so I probably saw Invasion USA in one of those, one of those blurs of action movie afternoons. Yeah. I mean, you, I think you probably did. You, you would have to. It's a lot of Chuck but Norris I, movies. I, don't get me wrong. Like a lot. So I, I, like, I probably saw this. There's like 184 deaths in it. Really? <laughs> yeah. It's just a gnarly little picture. Uh, pure Canon films nonsense. So, Hey, can we do something real quick? You, I, I I guess I hesitantly agree. Okay. Can we figure out who would win in a, any type of brawl fight? We have John Rambo, specifically from Rambo 2. Specifically Rambo. So we have U.S. US, US Army Green Beret John Rambo. He has 75 on-screen kills in the sequel. You know, he, he has helicopter blow. He blows people up in a helicopter. He He's Mud Rambo. He's Fire Rambo, he's Stab Rambo, he's Rope Rambo, he's Rocket Propel Grenade Launcher Rambo, he's Shotgun Knives, Bow and Arrow Rambo. He has invented yeah. the self-equipping montage Rambo. Oh. That, that, I, yep. I'm almost okay. positive that is the origin of the, uh, of the equipping 
montage where you see like the knife get sheathed, you know, the, the bandolier of, of bullets, the, this gun here, this gun here, headband on, like all that stuff. I think that was the origin of that. Cause evil dead two was 87. And I think Rambo two was before that. So yeah. Oh, all right. So we have John Rambo. Then we have uh, Nikolai Rachenko from red scorpion. He blows up tanks. He's just a tank. He kills 92 people. Then we have Arnold, a.k.a. John Matrix, a.k.a. United States Army Special Forces. He's a colonel. I mean, like, some people say he killed 87 to 88. Another kill count has it at, like, 107. <laughs> I counted it back in the day, but I forgot. I also know a lot of bullets missed him. But, John, these three square off. Okay, I, who wins? This is tough, okay, because for, well, first off, it's very good that you said Rambo too, because if you just said Rambo, I think of the the not the newest, but the first resurgence Rambo from like 2009 or so, and that is the most killingest machine I've <laughs> ever seen in a movie, and, and I don't even care what anyone says about a John Wick movie, no. That Rambo was the most efficient killer I've ever seen in a movie. So if it was him, he he takes out everybody wholesale murder easily. But okay, if we eliminate that, my caveats are kind of this. If it's grounded in reality, Dolph wins. Because he's Spetsnaz? Well, he just, he's the biggest. He just seems like he, he, so he's 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 very large, he's very trained, and he has given us the greatest demonstration of heart on screen. Yeah. Like that. So I'm picking him in reality, right? In reality. But like, if we're using movie land rules, John Matrix is one of the most unhittable by a bullet person in existence. And if you get close to him, well, granted, you know, Dolph is huge, but Arnold probably weighs the same at, you know, two and a half, three inches shorter. So. They're, they're pretty similarly matched, I think, in a fight, you know, based on their movie character history. And but but when it comes to guns, I feel like John Matrix is more likely to hit Nikolai with a bullet than the other way around. Yeah, because Matrix has this force around him. Right. That just prevents bullets. Right. He doesn't even have to dodge the bullets. When when, when you're the one, you won't have to. <laughs> Uh, and if you think about Rambo, he does hide a lot. What well, that he and, and he uses helicopters and explodes. So he he's out in the open a few times, but he's not out in the open like you know Nikolai is or Matrix. Well, and, and so, but Matrix is mean, dude. Matrix is a mean man. Sure. Sure. He, I mean, if, I, if someone kidnapped your daughter, Alyssa Milano, you too would be mean. Yeah. No, and, and listen, like. I think John Rambo is tough, but I don't want to see him fight Matrix. I, I just don't. And I know he was like fighting underground, like he was an underground fighter. Uh, Rambo was in these films, but I think Matrix would rip him to, to, to shreds. Oh, like the yeah, only thing that gives me hope is that, that there's. I don't think there's a fight to be had there. Yeah. See the thing, because he's a brutal. If we go, if we go Rambo though, and we are using the forest, Rambo wins. Yeah. Rambo wins. That that's when Rambo wins because he has the biggest skill set in addition to the, the 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 gorilla style training that he demonstrates anyway. No one else demonstrates gorilla training other than the most <laughs> basic component of using your opponent's weapons as you move forward. You know, like the most yeah. which which would apply to a lot of warfare realistically. It's just that classical warfare didn't even somehow consider that most of the time. But but like Rambo in the woods, Rambo wins. I mean the the other two could team up. Rambo still just wins. Period the end. So it's like no, this is hard point. to say. I feel like the circumstances matter. And the fact is is that y- you picked an almost impossible decision though, like just abstractly, I don't know. Okay, here here it Uh-oh. is. Jungle. Jungle. Rambo. Okay. So we have one for Rambo. All right. Um Fist fight where no one's teaming up against each other. Like they all get a chance to fight each other one on one. I'm I'm going I'm going for John Matrix. Okay, Matrix. Um, boxing match. Oh, well, hold on. Dolph didn't demonstrate 
any 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 boxing prowess. That straight movie. punch, that straight punch he throws in the bar. It's just so big, and that guy was practically was co- comparably probably a mook. Uh, okay, so who wins? I'm still inclined to say probably John Matrix. Okay, um, the compound in Commando. So okay, so that has that's almost like a journey thing though. There's planning. There's a lot of different settings. It's not quite ideally guerrilla, but but it lends itself a little to it. That that's where I think that Dolph comes into play. I think that that's that's okay. where that's where Nikolai has an edge. It. I I want to say him. Open combat field. Open. It's probably going to yeah. be John Matrix just because you can't hit him with a bullet. <laughs> All three of them are in a hel- an attack helicopters. They're in their own helicopters. Yes. Ooh. Inclined to say John Rambo. Yep. Good call, because he wipes people out in, in those. He's got a lot now, of helicopter experience. Bathroom fight. Bathroom fight. That's tough. <laughs> I'm thinking Matrix. I think Matrix. You know, it's like I, he, he's normally my de- default for the close quarters, but I feel like you see, you say bathroom ba- bathroom fight. I start thinking of using the bathroom, and I feel like Dolph is going to be better at using the bathroom than John Matrix. <laughs> okay, I like that kitchen fight. Same thing, Dol- Dolph. Maybe even oh shit, or maybe even Rambo at that point. But no, I'm gonna say Dolph. Still Dolph. Dolph in the okay. kitchen. Paintball. Rambo. Because there's always so many things to hide behind and everything. You know, it's a, it's a it's a variegated uh, terrain. So it's, it's, that's going to be Rambo every time. The Revenant s- scenario, but with the three of them. The, wait, you mean like sur- the survival aspect of the Revenant? Yeah, but they're trying to kill each other as well. Okay. Rambo. Although, you know, that's the actually hungry- a situation where Dolph's heart comes into play, though. That's a little tough. Uh, still, Gus says Rambo. See, Dolph, Dolph is a little downplayed because it's hard because it's hard without like the journey aspect. <laughs> Hell in a Cell. Hell in a Cell? Yeah. It's probably just Dolph because he has that great scene. <laughs> okay. It's Ryan James so right now, in like what looks like the jaw and the collarbone simultaneously with the toe of his boot. Like, I don't even know why we even saw Brian James on his feet later in that movie. <laughs> All right, so let's see. You have four for Rambo. Okay. All right. You have... Oh, wow. Three for Matrix. Aww. Interesting. Three for Matrix. And you have four for Dolph. Which what, really? Have four for Dolph? Yeah. Okay. So we're tied. That means we need a tiebreaker. So I am going to go... Blue Sea Compound. The underwater Compound. Compound. Oh, like, like, like the characters of Deep Blue Sea, like running around on there, yeah. right? Yeah. And they're killing each other. Kill- okay, um... Kind of Matrix, maybe? You know, you got, but you can use the water. That's that's yeah. a pretty Rambo thing to do. It is. We, there are inspirational speeches. That's a pretty Dolph yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. Relative to this. Oof. Oh, gosh. I don't even know, man. I, and I even came up with the idea. I was just thinking up something cool. I don't... I... I, I I'm almost inclined to say Rambo because you could you can loop around that thing. So Rambo wins it all. Is that a win for it all? I thought that just made three way yep. tie. Nope, because you had Rambo with four, okay. Matrix with three, and Dolph with four. So you just picked Rambo to win it all. Okay, all right, yeah. Well, good for Rambo. He earned it. He's got all those movies. <laughs> a lot of Rambo movies. <laughs> He's very accurate. I had to pull all of his stats once from his arrows. He's just ridiculously accurate. He's good at a lot of things. And yeah. yeah. In the long run, when, when you give when you give a, a lot of varied scenarios, it, it should make sense, I guess, that it goes to him. You know what? This was, and, and and you're right. In Rambo, he just when he gets on that machine gun in Rambo, I remember just going, Phew, "That's a that's a head blown up. That's a." That's a knife being thrown. That's an I arrow. feel like I saw like when he shot someone at the knee with that, I don't know, 50 caliber <laughs> gun. Like, it's not just that his tibia flew spiraling away. 
It's that the six inches of his knee seems to incinerate <laughs> in addition to that. Like, <laughs> and, and he was treating it with all the casual nature of a 14 year old in a 1996 arcade playing an early shoot 'em up game for a quarter. Okay. Without making you short circuit, who wins? All right. I'm just going to, I'm just going to drop this on you. Nikolai, his character from Universal Soldier, uh, Dolph's character from Universal Soldier, and the Punisher. Have you seen the Punisher? Wait, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So those three. Against oh, they're a team. Matrix. Oh, okay. Yep. Against, against Matrix, Harry from True Lies, and let's see, what other? And Conan versus Rocky, Rambo, uh, and Barney Ross from Expendables. Who leaves the room? It's just a free-for-all? Yeah. Three versus three versus three. I'm taking Dolph. I'm inclined to agree. Also, you included Universal Soldier, and he's augmented yeah, and, Dol- and Dolph is fair. already an augmented human. <laughs> I just bought Dolph a win. I'll take it. <laughs> so Dolph has won one. Uh, no, Schwarzenegger just hasn't won any. That's interesting. Well, you know, the thing is that Harry Tasker is, if we're talking about, like, hand-to-hand combat, like, he he's never actually demonstrated himself as an ace in hand-to-hand combat. He does. He wins the bathroom fight, and he wins against that very large Persian man uh, when they knock the guns away. Um, you know, during the nuke rally, whatever, right? Uh, but but he he has a tough time, and that is not necessarily a big bad or you know the number one henchman. This is not the Scott Adkins under Villain in Expendables Two. You know, it's. It's just some big muscular guy in both cases. Yeah. And Arnold's some big muscular guy. I mean, it, it just seems like he's been in a couple more fights and he knows how to take a hit better. You know, it's almost like it's almost that simple. Like the dude who's never been in a bar fight, who's never been in a fight, is more likely to lose against the guy who's been in three bar fights, even if he lost all three bar fights. Yeah. All right. I like it. So we got we got Dolph coming out on top at least. Conan is monstrous and all. And that is that is 240 pound Schwarzenegger. That is almost the heaviest he was ever on screen. It's the heaviest he was ever on screen in a popular movie. Like that was that's a tremendous Arnold. I just, yeah, I just think Universal Soldier and like Scott is going to is going to do it. That's just it. it. You, you already have augmented Dolph, and then you augment him more. It's, it's like he he's too he's too good. Oh man! Hey, well, John, this was great, man, uh, and thank you for joining me. And uh, where can people find you? Um, John's Horror Corner, most places. Although I don't know how to talk a tick, so none of that. But John's Horror Corner, there's a little tab on movies, films, and flicks for John's Horror Corner, right next to the little tab for the movies, films, and flicks podcast. That's right. So, uh, Hey John, thank you for joining me, man. This was awesome. Cheers. All right. So for me, Mark Hoffmeyer for John Levingood, this is movies, films, and flicks. We'll see you next week.